Good morning, good morning, and welcome. Uh, so you know, today is the start of our alumni weekend, and we have a whole host of events this weekend for everyone. Uh, but I have to say that I'm really, really excited about this particular event. I'm excited because this event gives us the opportunity to recognize two colleagues for their outstanding scholarship through the appointment to a named professorship. So first, just please join me in giving a well-deserved round of applause to Kevin Outerson, our new Austin B. Fletcher Professor of Law. And a round of applause to Jack Fairman, our new Philip S. Beck Professor of Law. So congratulations to you, Kevin and Jack, on this momentous occasion. Uh, name professorships are the highest honor, the most prestigious recognition that we bestow upon our faculty at BU Law. Name professorships are a signal to the broader academic community and to the world of a faculty member's exceptional accomplishments in research and of a faculty member's great value to the institution. They enable us to both recruit and retain our strongest and most competitive faculty because they provide honored faculty with additional resources to perform, as our university strategic plan indicates, research that matters. And because the title in and of itself helps to elevate the important messages that our faculty are conveying through their scholarship. Named professorships also carry incredible honor and prestige because of the phenomenal work and legacies of the people, our alumni, past faculty, and others who have become the namesakes for those professorships. In these cases, the namesakes for Professor Beerman's and Professor Alderson's professorships are BU Law alumni who have had highly distinguished careers. For example, Austin B. Fletcher received his law degree from Boston University School of Law in 1879. In addition to serving as counsel for many large corporations, he served as president and primary stockholder for a prominent law firm called Eppinger and Russell. He also served as president of the Board of Trustees for Tufts College and a trustee for Boston University. And ultimately, he became the namesake for the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, the first graduate-only school of international affairs. Philip S. Beck a named partner for the distinguished law firm Bartlett Beck, graduated from BU Law, where he also served as editor-in-chief of the Law Review in 1976. He's widely known as one of the best courtroom attorneys in the nation, and he's worked on some of the most prominent cases in our history. In Gore versus Bush, he headed George W. Bush's trial team in the Florida recount litigation that ultimately determined the 2000 presidential election. In Newsom versus McCabe, he won a record-setting, he won a record-setting damages verdict in a civil rights case involving the wrongful imprisonment of an innocent man for 15 years. I know that both professors Beerman and Outerson are very proud to hold their current professorships, not only because of the well-deserved recognition it provides them, but also because of the respect they have for the lawyers who serve as the namesakes for those professorships. All of us here at Boston University have long understood the Im immense importance of Professor Bierman's and Professor Outerson's work. Professor Jack Bierman is one of the most prolific and highly cited public law professors in the nation, and his incredible work has earned him many honors, including his most recent appointment as a senior fellow for the Administrative Conference of the United States. And I, from Gary Lawson said, this is a big deal. Right. <laughs> one of the last people to hold this, this one of the people who formerly held this position was our former Justice Antonin Scalia. Professor Alderson is one of the most cited professors in the health law field, and he is literally saving lives through his work as the executive director of combating antibiotic resistant bacteria by our pharmaceutical accelerator, otherwise known as Carbex, much easier to say. <laughs> It's a program that was inspired by his scholarly research and has raised more than $350 million in research grants. 
Over the course of this morning ceremony, we will hear more about these two professors' many contributions to academic and student life, as well as their outstanding leadership nationally and globally. But first, I want to take a moment to reiterate the broad impact of this remarkable achievement. As I noted before, named professorships are a marker of excellence for the university, our faculty and staff, our students, and our alumni. They signal our leadership, as both of these professors do, in particular fields of law. They help attract and retain high caliber faculty that our alumni and students expect. And they further solidify our legacy as a top tier law school. I was fortunate to have seen some of these effects firsthand when I had the privilege of being named the inaugural Ryan Roth Gallo and Ernest J. Gallo Professor of Law. A named professorship solidified resources for my work and has given it a standing that I could scarcely have hoped for. For this reason, among many others, it gives me great joy to recognize two of my fantastic colleagues with this honor. It's no small accomplishment. And I know I speak for all of us when I say, Kevin and Jack, you have done this community very proud. No less proud, I'm certain, are your families. And I know some of them are here with you today. I want to extend a warm welcome to Jack's father, Miles, his wife, his wife, Deborah, his sister, Barbara, And his four amazing children, his son, or three of his children, his son, uh, his sons Adam, Zachary, and Sam. Sam is a student here. And his daughter, Leona. And I want to extend an equally warm welcome to Kevin's wife, Maria. And his daughters, Caitlin and Abigail. Which one was the one um, pointing at mom? Abigail was the one pointing at mom. Okay, I like your energy. Um, so I'm sure you're all eager to, for the ceremony to get underway. So let me waste no time in introducing our interim provost and, and chief academic officer, Dr. Kenneth Luchin. Dr. Luchin was named interim provost in July 2023 and is the university's second ranking officer. He provides leadership in BU's overall academic, budgetary, and planning processes and oversees his academic programs, research enterprise, global programs, and student recruitment and success. Provost Luchin leads a host of offices and initiatives designed to enhance BU's academic integrity and global competitiveness, including its divisions in undergraduate, graduate, and online education, faculty affairs, digital learning and innovation, and community and inclusion. Efforts to incorporate general education for all undergraduates and to promote student well-being and the implementation of BU's latest 10-year strategic plan. Prior to his appointment as provost, Provost Luchin was dean of BU's College of Engineering from 2006 to 2023, where he oversaw dramatic gains in the college's national and global stature. And that included a rise from 54th to 36th in its national graduate ranking and an overall ranking of 16th among all private universities. Among the world's leading scholars in the field of respiratory mechanics, Provost Luchin is a professor of biomedical engineering and has been a member of the BU faculty since 1984. He is past president of the American Institute of Medical and Biological Engineering and is an elected fellow of the Biomedical Engineering Society and the International Academy of Medical and Biological Engineering. Welcome, Provost Luchin. That was a long introduction. <laughs> Thank you, Dean and Watcher Willig. Uh, let me start by saying what a wonderful event this is. It's a fantastic event, not just in general because of its celebration of faculty, but it's on Alumni Weekend. It's a weekend where we're celebrating our alumni, their accomplishments, their success, their impact on society. And I would say that all of that success and all of that impact is largely due to the foundational experiences and education and mentoring they had when they were students here at Boston University. And that is largely due to the quality of the faculty that mentored them and taught them. 
and prepared them for the world. We're here to celebrate faculty. And a great university fundamentally depends on the greatness of its faculty and that ability of that faculty to produce scholarship and advance education so that we're perpetually creating people that make society move forward in a positive way. And that's what we're here celebrating today. So it's really an honor uh, to share with you this important day at the School of Law, which is so important to Boston University. We're celebrating Ke Professors Kevin Alderson, and who has the new Austin B. Fletcher Professor of Law, and Jack Bierman, who is the new Philip Beck Professor of Law. Our academic leadership as an institution joins me in our deep pride for Professor Alderson and Professor Bierman's groundbreaking work, and in our gratitude to Phil Beck and his family for the dramatic and generous vote of confidence in that work. BU's continued uh, emergence as one of the nation's premier private universities depends on our ability, as I said, to attract and retain, as Angela said, great faculty, because great faculty recruit other great faculty and then great students. It is the assistance of the generous and thoughtful donors and alumni like Mr. Beck and, of course, the late Austin Fletcher that has the potential to accelerate the careers of future researchers, both at the student level and the faculty level as well. Endowed professorships are indispensable in the recruitment and retention of great faculty. It's the coin of the realm among faculty. It's the ultimate honor. They're powerful ways to express our support and belief in our faculty leaders and the transformative work that they do every day in the classroom and with their scholarship. Over the course of the most recent capital campaign, BU has been excited to welcome some 58 new endowed professorships throughout the entire university, making important advances in fields like natural and social sciences, health sciences, business, education, engineering, and of course, law. The holder of these endowed professorship, or one of the holders of these endowed professorships, is your dean, as Dean Anwachi Willig is the inaugural holder of the Ryan Roth Gallo and Ernest J. Gallo professorship. Well deserved. The BU Law School is a remarkable and valuable gem of Boston University, not only to BU, but for society at large. It has a track record and a deep commitment to attracting law students from all socioeconomic backgrounds. Unlike many other law schools that I'm familiar with, one of the highest priorities it has is to produce lawyers and law scholarship that can positively impact all facets of society and communities, representing the full range of diversity that society put, uh, puts forward. In addition, the law school faculty are committed to the educational mission. Several have been recognized in recent years with the Metcalf Cup. In fact, recognition of the first Metcalf Award in 1974 went to Professor Paul Wallace of the law school who received that honor. The gifts we recognize today celebrate remarkable records of accomplishment in the fields of antimicrobial resistance law, civil rights litigation, and administrative law, and make more accomplishments of this kind possible in the future. The value, of, the value proposition of Boston University to society rests on faculty like Professors Arson and Bierman, and we're deeply in, 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 uh, indebted to you for your, the great work you've done. So thank you very much. We cannot be more grateful to both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Provost Luchin. Next, I'd like to welcome Professor Mohamed Zaman, who is going to say a few words about his friend and colleague, Professor Kevin Alderson. Dr. Zaman is, Howard, is the Howard Hughes Medical Institute Professor of Biomedical Engineering and International Health at Boston University. His research is focused on the interface of cell biology, mechanics, mechanics systems biology, and medicine. In 2020, he was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship. That same year, he published Biography of Resistance, the epic battle between people and pathogens, in which he warns of the growing risk of drug-resistant infections. Like Professor Alderson, he's focused on having global impact through his work. In particular, his work is centered on advancing technologies and solutions to improve the quality and practice of medicine in the developing world. To further this goal, he created an educational program, QEPIC, focus on cultivating engineers who have a rigorous global outlook and a deep understanding of challenges in emerging markets and resource-limited settings. Professor Zaman is a fitting ambassador for Professor Alderson's accomplishments. Both scholars exemplify BU's leadership 
collaboration, and engagement with the larger world on some of the most pressing issues of our time. Welcome, Professor. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Dean Onwachi Willig and, and Ken. So Ken was my dean from the moment I came here um, until two months ago. So, so I owe a lot um, to him, and, and um, I'm deeply grateful for this honor. Um, I'm really honored to be uh, here to celebrate and recognize the incredible contribution of Professor Kevin Alderson, my colleague and friend whom I've known for well over a decade. I will not repeat his impressive CV here, but we'll talk about three dimensions of his incredible impact in the field and on me personally. First is Kevin the Scholar. There are very, very few legal scholars, perhaps just in low single digits, whose work has had such a profound impact on some of the biggest global health challenges of our time. Kevin's work has shaped so much of how we want to tackle antimicrobial resistance, a problem in this country, in this city, and in all corners of the world. And it is one of the foremost challenges of our time and a topic of great research interest to me as well. His impact is not only on policy and treaties, but on technology development all the way to basic science. That is quite extraordinary. The second dimension is Kevin the mentor. Now I mentioned that his work has had such a profound impact. That is absolutely true. But I'm no legal scholar or a lawyer, so some of what Kevin has written, like a lot of the law literature, is completely incomprehensible to me. <laughs> I'm not sure if it is in English. He says it is. So I have to take his word on that. So here comes Kevin the mentor, who has translated these ideas into clear, actionable policy and research directions. He has taught me and so many of my colleagues through, uh, through his vision and clarity of thought. He has mentored me and so many of my own students in basic science and engineering all the way to policy around the world. Speaking of around the world, you have a much better chance of meeting Kevin in Accra, Ghana than in Boston. Um, <laughs> so here comes Kevin's the, Kevin the friend. Whether Kevin is in Accra, Seoul, Toronto or London, or sometimes in Boston, rarely, he's always available. He's just a text or a call away. He's generous with his advice, honest in his opinion, deep in his thought, and always there to help. He has shaped so much of our thinking about some of the most pressing global health issues of our time, current and the ones that may be just around the corner, and changed my own career and of so many others around the world for the better. I'm honored to be here and incredibly delighted for Kevin for this richly deserved honor. One of the things I, I love about Muhammad is, um, you know, he's taken uh, engineering and done amazing things with it that, that work with global health. And we didn't even mention your new center. You know, he has a new center, which is another pivot uh, at this point in his career, the Center for Forced Displacement, displacement uh, what some people might think of as refugees, and to make sure that uh, we study and understand and protect and serve those people. Okay, so my, my goal, <laughs> my goal today is to get through this next 25 minutes without crying, okay? <laughs> I've never been to an investiture, it feels kind of vaguely medieval, doesn't it? <laughs> um, and uh, so I, not knowing exactly what one does, and I'm going to talk a little bit about my work and some vision for how things can change, uh, how we're trying to save the world, protect the world from superbugs, how BU made that possible for me to do that. Um, do you know, um, some of you who are alums here at the law school may remember the former law um, library annex uh, next door, you know, down those scary stairs, okay? Who remembers the scary, it's also where law review used to be, right, before they got the exalted night, okay? That's now been updated and it's the global headquarters of Carbex. <laughs> That's where we are. So some fun facts about the law school to start with. I think we're the only law school with a biopharmaceutical accelerator. Uh, we're, the, uh, we're bound to be the law school with the largest externally funded research program, I, th I think. Um, updating your numbers, we're at 850 million now. We'll, we'll cross a billion within 12 months, okay? Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure we're the law school that's uh, been associated with the most patent applications globally in the past six years. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm doing things for, for you to put in, the, in your book and whatnot. 
And uh, is there another, any other law school that has more full-time PhDs in chemistry, toxicology, pharmacology, and, and uh, microbiology? I don't think so. <laughs> we have more than Yale, more than Harvard at the law school. Um, so, you know, we, we have some impact there. But I want to focus on the fact that all of us here, we're, we're living in a time and a place of just immense privilege. You know, two of my, uh, one of my daughters, uh, not one that's here today, and one of my grandchildren um, had serious bacterial infections near at birth, you know, within the first couple days at birth. Both of them were successfully treated with antibiotics. Both of them survived it well. Um, that is not true over most of human history that would have ended in grief. And even today, for most of humanity, it would end in grief because most people don't have access uh, to these drugs. Um, as a result, you know, we have just millions of deaths around the world. It's 13 or 14 million deaths from bacterial infection around the world today. Um, not, you know, the bulk of them are actually bacterial infections that we could treat with today's antibiotics if we're able to get them to everyone. But, but an increasing number of them from ones that uh, are no longer effective, the antibiotics no longer work against these infections. If you invent an amazing cancer drug, it's gonna work forever, right? Uh, it, it, headache medicine, you know, uh, when you take an aspirin, it worked fine 100 years ago, it still works fine today, right? It's not true with any anti-infective treatment. Um, resistance, evolution, uh, you know, makes it so that we have to continue to innovate just to avoid uh, falling behind. And so the fact of this biological presence of evolution that changes the output, the effectiveness of output of, of, of drug innovation changes everything in, in, in this field. It, for me, it changes everything in how I approach innovation in this field. And it's the, the fundamental sort of path of my research work. My project, you know, going back now more than two decades is to Think about the legal ecology of resistance, how law interacts with the fact of microbial resistance uh, as a part of health law, but then how we should change the law so that we can maximize uh, these legal tools, so that we can maximize the sustainability of our interaction with the microbial world. I do not want to eradicate microbes. Um, <laughs> if we did that, we would lose beer and wine bread, cheese, um, our microbiomes, you know, the human biology would be messed up. With, with, you know, lots of things would change. And so we want to have a sustainable relationship with these. And so with law, you know, my, the re way I framed this 18 years ago now is to think about two goals. One is to produce new tools, new antibiotics, new antivirals, new vaccines. The other one is to conserve the ones we have, to make them last longer. And then the legal tools, you can think of, of contract and property uh, and tort and regulation as ways to, to do that. It creates eight grids when, when you build that little chart. Almost everything in the legal literature and policy literature was focused on two out of those eight. Was thinking about property to produce new things, intellectual property law, or regulation uh, to extend the life um, of, of useful drugs what the Centers for Disease Control and Communications does. And so my contribution is to be, say, well, let's think about contract. How can we use contract? And this would be reimbursement. How do we change the way we pay for antibiotics, not only so we get new ones, but so that the ones that we have will last longer. Um, I think of this whole field as the effectiveness of antibiotics are a global common pool resource. Um, not antibiotics themselves, those are obviously private goods, but the effectiveness of antibiotics is a global common pool. Anytime I use it, it makes it less effective for you tomorrow or our children in 10 years or 20 years or somebody else around the world. Every time that we prevent, fail to prevent infection, it's bad actually for that person. It's also bad for all of us, right? You can think of this as a, as a pond that, that's a fishery. Uh, who's restocking the pond? Who's making sure there's enough food for tomorrow? Actually, almost no one is doing this. Uh, but now there's a lot of people who are thinking about this. So I have a couple of, of analogies to, to, to think about this global common pool effectiveness idea um, that uh, I've written about in various settings. One of them is the, the pond, you know, the ecological idea. Uh, we don't want to just uh, produce you know, endless quantities of fish or, or antibiotics. 
We want a sustainable system in which uh, we can withdraw the utilization, and there's a lot more people today who should be getting antibiotics that aren't getting them, especially in low and middle income uh, countries. And then also to think about how to make sure that the production going into that is sustainable. Another way to think about it is infrastructure. Um, my family who's here, um, you know, our street is a disaster and has been for a while, okay? <laughs> the, uh, the happy news is that I live in a beautiful 130-year-old house. How old is our house? You know, something like that. It's a beautiful house. Uh, the, the bad news is that I live in a 130-year-old house, <laughs> which uh, gratefully I have the salary to support, you know, all of the things such a house needs. But it's not just the house. The fact that the house is that old means the sewer and water pipes in Somerville, in my part of the town, are also 125 years old. They were designed for a 100-year useful life. They've stretched out. It's time to replace them, okay? And they're digging up the streets ever so slowly uh, to replace them. It's a wonderful thing to have clean water and sewage treatment. You know, nothing has been a more signal improvement in public health than that. Right? Clean water, clean food, sewage treatment. Uh, but it's a mess. But the positive thing is that the city of Somerville, despite all appearances, are not randomly selecting my street to dig up. <laughs> they have a plan, right? You know, they, they've prioritized. They know the oldest pipes. We, we get it. And, and, and they have a system. They have a department of experts. They, they think about this in decades, not days. And they, uh, and they have financing that goes on. Uh, you know, they, they finance this by bonds that have 30 and 40 year lives, right? No one is doing this for antibiotics. Nobody understands or is looking at this as a global piece of infrastructure for civilization. No one has long term thought or plans on how to replace them, when to replace them, what we need to do next, where should we be investing. Uh, the work of Carbex and the work of people around us is beginning to do that infrastructure. Okay. Another way to think about it is fire protection. You can see in the ceiling some of these little circles. Uh, if one of you uh, pulled out a flamethrower, that thing would descend and, and water would cover us all, okay? <laughs> we would be grateful for that. This is the sort of equipment you'd love to have. Building codes require it, but it's good to have. And you also hope it's never used, right? Um, it's antibiotics, in a sense, the most novel, important ones are the, the thing we want to put behind glass and use as little as possible for the first five or 10 or 20 years. That's great for us to have it available for the one in a million who needs it. It's a terrible idea for the company. They go through a 20 year development cycle, they get an FDA approval, they're ready to celebrate, and then you tell them, oh, we're not gonna buy very much for about a decade or two. That's called bankruptcy, okay? There'll be an article in the Wall Street Journal this next week talking about how every small public company in the past decade who's brought an antibiotic to market has gone either into bankruptcy or the economic equivalent of it because of this fundamental insight. We want to save the drugs, but we don't want to pay for them in advance. That is a disaster for the companies. But think about the, the people here. Did the company that made that equipment, do you think they got paid? I think they got paid years ago when it was installed. The, the, the individuals who installed it, did they get paid? Of course they did. We don't wait until we have a fire to pay for that. Okay? We pay for it in advance as protection. And, and the reforms that are occurring and the way that we think about paying for antibiotics, which are now implemented in the United Kingdom, it's proposed legislation in the United States. There's now a formal proposal in Europe, a formal proposal in Canada, you know, actually motion towards that in Japan. The G7 is actually beginning to adopt this model that's ecological, that's infrastructure, that thinks of it um, in, in these ways. The solutions here have to have at least three legs. You have to think about innovation, which is the part that's more my world. You have to think about access, because most of the people in the world don't have access today to these amazing antibiotics. And you have to think about stewardship or conservation, making sure that they last for a longer period of time. Whatever is done here has to, to have all three of those things uh, simultaneously, which is why changing the way we pay for antibiotics and doing it in a way that rewards the company, but does not incentivize them to oversell it is the key. And, and the insight here, uh, you know, what the United Kingdom has now successfully implemented is to pay a subscription. They're paying a prize. That's not dependent on the volume of the drug sold. It's dependent on how valuable it is to public health. And now the United Kingdom has picked two drugs and will continue to do so in the future. And, 
and legislation in the other G7 countries uh, to fundamentally change how we pay for antibiotics, which is designed to simultaneously solve for access innovation and stewardship. Anyway, so I want to say a little bit about why I'm grateful to Boston University. And I, do I have five more minutes? I don't know. Um, so when I went to, to Jyothi Nandakumar, who's, who's the finance administrator, grants administrator for law school, in, in 2016 and said, I want to write a grant for $250 million. She did not laugh me out of the room. She actually worked on it and helped me to put it together. Uh, Maureen O'Rourke, where is Maureen? Yeah, was the dean at the time. Maureen may have, did you laugh? You probably laughed quietly. <laughs> you know, and it, it's probably like, um, oh, Kevin. But what's the harm of letting him try? Thank you for letting me try, right? I mean, other deans could have said. <laughs> I've actually got that original proposal with your signature on it. You know, I, I haven't framed it, but I keep it. <laughs> So thank you. Um, and BU Office of Sponsored Programs helped me get that in by the deadline, and, and off we went. Um, we got the award not because of a cleverly written thing, but because I brought together the US government and Welcome Trust, who was not part of the original agreement. Uh, US government brought in $200 million. At that point, the Welcome Trust brought in $155 million in that first grant, made them a partnership. And, and gained their trust over time so that we've expanded the partnership to include uh, Canada, the United Kingdom, the Gates Foundation. Uh, soon we'll be announcing, um, and Germany. Um, uh, it's in the budget for Japan, but we don't have an agreement yet. And uh, it's also, um, uh, we'll, we'll find out soon from one of the world's richest foundations, not already named, uh, <laughs> that they'll be giving us money in this next year as well. Uh, because what we're doing fulfills the vision for solving this problem in a sustainable way. That's why people give us money. Um, but uh, I, I just want to say another thanks to the law school because when I first came here, um, I was, I, this was my topic, this was my job talk paper, was on this topic, uh, about what I wanted to do back in 2007. And, and shortly after I arrived here, uh, somebody arranged, maybe it was you, Gary, um, to, for me to, to get this David Saul Smith Award. It was you, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, thank you, Gary. <laughs> it's my first grant, and my first grant in antibiotics, $20,000. I used it to buy data, okay, because I'm a nerd, and, and to publish papers. And then that paper that published with that $20,000 of the data, Robert Wood Johnson gave me $150,000, and I used that to buy more data and to work with some other people published those papers, and those papers are what the U.S. government said, and Welcome said, let's do this next thing, okay? So, you know, those little grants, 20,000, you know, thank you to David Saul Smith, who's not here, I think, and, and, uh, and then it, they leverage over time, and I'm grateful for that opportunity. Uh, I came here from Boston University. Uh, I came here from West Virginia University, and, um, and I wanted to move here because I knew that what I wanted to do couldn't happen any place other than Boston. Boston, you may not understand, it is the, the global center for antibacterial innovation. Nobody in the world is surprised that we're in Boston. The AMR Action Fund, which is a billion dollar endeavor for for-profit companies, is here in Boston. And, and you know, the repair, you know, many different things that revolve around this world are here. And so I wanted to be here, okay? But um, I'm grateful, where is Fran Miller? Yeah, Fran. So, so Fran was res responsible for recruiting me here? Or, or she tried very hard and I was grateful to respond to it. Uh, Fran ran health law here. She's allegedly emerita here <laughs> for like a decade. Didn't you retire a decade ago? Okay, and yet here she is. And yet every week she's teaching the FDA class here in the fall. Uh, at Boston University. Fran convinced me to come here, and I was so taken by the opportunities for health law in Boston University and AMR work in Boston in general um, that uh, I, I gave up tenure at West Virginia to come here without tenure, maybe trusting the faculty too much. <laughs> but it's working out so far, so I'm grateful for that. Um, 
I think also the, a chair like, like what I have, you know, the, the, the ability to have the intellectual freedom to pursue curiosity and, and to do what you think is in front of you. It wasn't like anyone else was doing my path. I, you know, the freedom of resources, the grant, uh, the fact that as legal academics, we have a lot of freedom. We have a lot of freedom to pursue the research we want. I'm grateful for that. And, um, you know, I'm sorry to my colleagues that I'm gone so much. Um, it's gone in, in, the, in the efforts for, for Carbex. I go on yet another around the world Carbex fundraising thing. I leave tomorrow. I'm gone for two weeks. I'm also grateful to my family. I'm joined here today by Maria, my wife of, and life partner of 36 years. <laughs> and um, two of my daughters, uh, two of my four daughters, Caitlin and Abigail. What? You're making a face at me. <laughs> Both of them have uh, degrees from Boston University, one from uh, the College of Arts and Science, Caitlin, and in economics and, and Abby, most recently in the School of Public Health, um, recently graduated with MPH. You know, I, I, I have the wonderful privilege of sharing life with these amazing people. Um, my biggest, you know, regret on this whole Carbex thing is how often it takes me away from such excellent people. Okay? But hopefully it's worth it. <laughs> and, uh, and I want to thank, uh, you know, the university for making everything that the Carbex team does possible. And thank you for this moment today to, to pause and to think about that and to say thank you back. Take care. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you for your innovation and your leadership. And we thank you and the world thanks you. All right. So now, as you can see from the program, our next speaker was slated to be BU Law alum and parent, Justice David Lowy from the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, who is going to introduce his friend, Professor Jack Bierman, who is also a BU Law parent, as I said earlier. Uh, unfortunately, Judge Justice Lowy had a scheduling conflict develop at the last minute, and so he can no longer be here. But I have to say, we have the best pinch, pinch hitter that I could imagine, uh, my friend and colleague, Professor Gary Lawson. It's actually quite fitting that Professor Lawson will introduce Professor Bierman, because he held the position of the Philip S. Professor, Philip S. Beck Professor of Law from 2012 to 2022, when he was named a William Fairfield Warren Distinguished Professor. He has authored or co-authored nine editions of a textbook on administrative law, a textbook on constitutional law, five university press books, and more than 100 scholarly articles on topics ranging from aspects of constitutional theory and history to the proof of legal propositions. I mean, just he's incredibly prolific, it's uh, stunning. His work has been cited in 19 opinions of United States Supreme Court justices. Professor Lawson twice clerked for Justice Antonin Scalia, first at the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit, and then at the United, United States Supreme Court. He is a founding member and serves on the board of directors of the Federalist Society for Law and Public Policy Studies, is on the editorial advisory board of the Heritage Guide to the Constitution, in addition to his many scholarly achievements, Professor Lawson is one of the faculty members who is most dedicated to the law school community. He currently serves as the Associate Dean for Intellectual Life, though that only really scratches the surface of all that he does for the law school. We're grateful that our students have an opportunity to learn from him, and I'm delighted to have an opportunity to hear from him today. Welcome, Professor Lawson. Thank you. Um, in my nearly quarter of a century here, Jack Bierman has been a colleague, an occasional co-author, a fellow progressive rock aficionado and concert goer, 
uh, the co-author of the second best administrative law case book <laughs> on the market, and mostly a consummate legal academic. Jack is a scholar of all trades. I think it's scholar, Jack, scholar, all, okay, that's subtle. <laughs> um, he can do careful doctrinal analysis, high-level theory, engaging legal history, engaging fictional legal history, and he does all of it with one of the cardinal academic virtues, and that is integrity. You always know what Jack is doing, whether it's describing, prescribing, critiquing, speculating, kvetching, <laughs> uh, not something to take for granted. As a teacher, he has taught a staggering array of courses and an even more staggering array of students who he somehow seems to know all of them over the course of decades. It's unbelievable how that happens. Uh, and as, if any of them know what's going on today, they are probably thinking to themselves, it's about damned time. <laughs> As a citizen of the law school, Jack is unparalleled. Uh, if he is not, in fact, the heart and soul of the life of the law school, he is at, at the very least the pancreas. <laughs> and as a result, it is my great honor and privilege to introduce the Philip S. Beck Professor of Law at Boston University School of Law, Jack Bierman. Well, thanks, Gary. Uh, Kevin, you, maybe you didn't cry during your talk, but I was crying because I have to follow you, and that's really, uh, that's really difficult, but uh, that was fabulous and makes the rest of us feel inadequate in everything we've ever done in our lives. <laughs> but, uh, um, Gary, thank you. You're a, um, you're a real good pinch hitter for my friend uh, David Lowy, who uh, wishes he could be here. And I, I especially want to thank uh, Dean Angela and Wachi Willig for all the support that she's given me in the five years that she's uh, been my dean. And I really, and I know Gary was involved in selecting me for, to be his successor in this, uh, in this, and I don't think it was just because he didn't want someone that was better than him to have it after him. <laughs> but. Um, you know, they, you, a school can use uh, a chair as a way to attract someone from the outside, so it's especially gratifying that, um, that uh, my colleagues and my dean uh, chose to, uh, to honor me with, with this. So, and I want to thank BU and I, I'll, Provost Luchin and uh, all the provosts that I've worked with over the years, and BU has been incredibly supportive of everything that I've uh, been doing and, um, and also been uh, respectful of my time and energy when I c couldn't do the next thing they asked me to do. So I really appreciate it. So Boston University has transformed in a way uh, over the 40 years that I've been around here. Yes, it's almost 40 years, um, uh, incredibly so. And I think that if you just look at the, uh, the output of our school and the quality of our students and the accomplishments of our alumni, you'd see that. Um, I want to thank Phil Beck, who unfortunately couldn't be here because of personal circumstances. He's one of the best trial lawyers in the country, and he's from my hometown, and a lot of my friends back home know him or know of him. Um, and uh, it's just really great to be associated with his, um, with his name and also the, um, my, you know, my hometown of Chicago. And there's another great Chicago trial lawyer here today, Miles Bierman, my father, who, um, <laughs> he, um, uh, he got, the, he got licensed as a lawyer the month that I was born, which is years ago. And uh, uh, he, um, you know, he's someone that uh, uh, I look up to and I know I'll never live up to, but he's been a great example and uh, inspiration for me. Um, and I, I look forward to seeing Phil and my father also at an event we're going to do in Chicago in a month or so. So for any of you alumni that are here that are also in Chicago, you'll have another chance. I'll try not to give the exact same talk there. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I arrived here in, in uh, 1984 knowing almost nobody in Boston. Uh, and uh, BU has given me really a family, uh, both figuratively and literally. My wife is a member of the class of 85 here in the law school. And she's been an incredible support for me over the years. And 
She was never in my class. It's not like that. Uh, she, um, she does rave about her experiences with uh, professors Bill Rickman and le the late Michael Melton, who was a really dear member of our faculty who died much too young. Um, and our first date was May 13th, 1985, which was just before her graduation, but after the, the last time that I could vote against letting her graduate. <laughs> so, um, and then we have, uh, you know, my son Sam was, uh, uh, Angela stole all my thunder of interest in my family. My son Sam is here. He's a member of the class of 2024. He's a fantastic budding young lawyer. He's in the midst of that third year job search. So if any of the alumni here have an opening, uh, <laughs> go for it. Um, and my son Adam and my daughter Rosie are both here. They're both um, amazing young professionals here in Boston. Um, and also uh, Olivier Narcisse, who is an honorary member of our family, is sitting here with, uh, between Adam and Sam, and he'll be at lunch. So if you want to, if you want to meet the family, uh, feel free to talk to all of them. Uh, Olivier works for New Balance uh, and uh, helps run their sports facility. So if you want your basketball league to play there, see him. I also want to acknowledge two uh, judicial friends of mine who are here. Justice Scott Kafker is here somewhere. He's a member at the Supreme Judicial Court. And he um, uh, immortalized the, the two of us and another person in the room and David Lowy when he wrote an opinion that um, frequently mentioned errant golf shots having to do with a, 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 a homeowner whose house was uh, frequently pummeled by golf balls. So um, uh, we're a member, we are members of the errant golf shot club. And also I want to acknowledge uh, Judge James Lang who's here, who I've known, he was a classmate of my wife's here at the law school. He's one of our most outstanding alumni. He's a superior court judge. And I'm really, he'll understand why I'm saying this, but I'm really gratified for the fact that he's had this opportunity to meet my father. Um, so now one of the things I'm most proud of in the law school are the students and alumni in this great school. And it really makes me proud every day to be associated with some of the great students uh, that I've had and that I have now and of the, the incredibly accomplished group of, and diverse group of students and alumni. And I was gonna use PowerPoints today because you know, you're fancy use PowerPoints, but that would have meant that you wouldn't have seen these beautiful portraits behind me. And uh, I mean, that's a defect in the design of the room that when someone's using a PowerPoint, you don't see these. These are three of our most outstanding alumni. And the thing about our alumni, and it goes back to the beginning of our school, is quality and diversity. We've always been open to everybody. And it's a, it's a really uh, um, a wonderful thing to be associated with an institution like this. It has that in our, has it in our DNA. And there's been, uh, I've been supported over the almost 40 years here by uh, um, many great deans, including Maureen O'Rourke, who's here, who uh, um, represents the central administration now, but we don't hold that uh, against her. Um, and uh, two, two who have passed on, uh, Bill Schwartz and Joe Broadley. Joe was the interim dean when I, was, when I got tenure. And then Colin Diver and Ron Cass, who are still my co-authors on our administrative law casebook. And Ron also wanted to be here. He's been a very important mentor and co-author um, uh, uh, to me. And he brought me into the community of administrative law scholars and practitioners. And he's been a very important part of my career and remains a valued friend and colleague. And I just want to, I want to, um, I want to uh, acknowledge him and also, just for those of you that are students here or were students when he was dean, uh, he really was the one who made this a student-friendly place. And so it's a, it was a great accomplishment of his, and uh, he's, his presence is always felt here by me. Now, so at a chair investiture, as Kevin did, we're supposed to talk a little bit about academics. But I also want to talk first about the, uh, I'm going to get to that, but I want to talk a little bit about the, the changes I've seen here at the law school. And, and I'm in my 40th year now. And I still feel like I'm one of the new guys, although since there's hardly anyone else that was here when I started, I guess, and most of my colleagues are much younger, some of them were even born when I started here, um, I guess I can't really claim that I'm one of the new guys, and especially I've had one parent-child combination take my class not at the same time, and so um, I guess I'm long in the tooth. But one thing that hasn't changed at all is our insistence on the quality of our scholarship and of our education and the integrity that we approach the study of law with, and that's really important, and also we've only strengthened our commitment to diversity, and uh, so, which is, again, one of the founding pillars of this school and of the university. But other things have changed radically. The building, the new Sumner Redstone building, which I, I was on the building committee since before my current students were born, and it was originally announced that it was gonna be built in 1982, but it finally did get built about seven, eight years ago, and the renovated tower. We now, one of our strengths is the building. We tried to change the way the outside looks, but the pres preservationists of the world wouldn't let us get away with it. But also, the, um, the path-making, our new focus on experiential learning, 
not to the detriment of the traditional law school uh, um, uh, focus on legal doctrine and legal reasoning. Our path-baking programs in areas such as diverse as, uh, diverse as human trafficking and, uh, trans and uh, um, high-tech startups. Uh, our excellent transactional programs, including one of the leading programs in the country on contract drafting. We've led the way our whole time uh, at this law school since we were founded 150 years ago. Um, uh, and we pioneered the three-year law school program, which those third years in the room may view as a form of medieval torture, but which we, uh, it's been adopted universally in this country and for good reason. Now back to the academics. And of course, the most important thank you, and this is going to sound like more thank yous, but it's really a segue into the academics. The most important thing to my, um, other than my family, uh, in, in what I've done over here in the last 40 years has been my colleagues on the faculty. And we have an amazing, outstanding group of faculty here. I'm so glad to see so many people here uh, today. And um, one of the ones I want to mention, though, is a long departed faculty member named Bob Lieberman. Does anyone here remember, other than me, remember Bob Lieberman? Anyone have him in a class here? Right. Oh, there's, yeah, okay. So Bob was, Bob was kind of an interesting, cranky kind of guy. And, you know, I think maybe he liked me because I'm also kind of a cranky guy. But uh, when I first arrived here, he was amazed because I had a little Macintosh computer on my desk. So he wanted to come watch me writing. And he would stand over me like this, this senior faculty member who, he was having a little trouble because he'd had some strokes by then, but he would stand with his hand on my shoulder and he'd, I'd be writing and he'd be looking at what I'm writing. And like, <laughs> like, okay. And then he says to me, he goes, so you seem to like the Supreme Court's role in our government, you know, that they have all this power to strike down laws. He said, he said, name me a federal statute in the history of this country that's been struck down by the Supreme Court that you're happy they struck down. And I went, oh, you know, it's hard to do that. Uh, and so I started thinking more critically about the Supreme Court. I lost my uh, instinct as a knee-jerk liberal, which you had to have if you were going to survive and be at all liberal at University of Chicago Law School where I was a student. Um, <laughs> but it made me really start thinking about the role of the Supreme Court and how the Supreme Court in this country, with all of its strength, for ex one example that I've worked on, it was the Supreme Court that really paved the way for the misery that they put generations of our fellow citizens through, through Jim Crow and the way that the Supreme Court basically destroyed Congress's wonderful program to create an equal and free society for everyone here, whether regardless of the skin color or status as a former slave or anything like that. So I'm going to talk about another episode of judicial reform that's going on right now, which is the, I wanted to have a, like a light, upbeat kind of talk, so I decided on talking about judicial reform in Israel uh, for the rest of my time. And we've seen these massive public protests in Israel against the current government's reform efforts, and even threats by reserve members of Israel's military not to serve if those reforms are put through. And that's really striking, because Israel lives in a hostile environment. Uh, and, it, it, and its whole, uh, uh, you know, this is the most striking political unrest in this young country's history, and it's really treacherous. And the argument in favor of reforms is democracy, that the political branches of Israel's government ought to have more control over the judiciary, and the judiciary frustrates democracy. Now, it would be a really big surprise if hundreds of thousands of centrist and left-leaning Israelis were campaigning on the streets in order to get, keep democracy out of their government, in order to stop democracy. So the question is, what does it mean, democracy, in a situation like that? And it's really not about democracy. It's about preserving the values of a democratic, multicultural society that are being threatened by the proposed reforms in Israel. The new coalition government, led by Prime Minister Ben Netanyahu, has, has proposed four reforms directed at the courts, mainly the Supreme Court. And only one of them has passed so far. Here are the four. And by the way, I want to thank third-year law student Wally Miller for doing the research that helped me with this. Now, for those of you that know the name, yeah. it's the perfect name to be associated with Boston University Law School. And I've told Wally that there was a faculty member here with that name. And I got to see Wally after he'd left Boston and moved to Ann Arbor to be with his daughter. And he was just a, a, a superstar mentor, teacher, scholar, and friend to everybody that ever came across him. Um, so, but the four things that um, the, the uh, government wants to do is, first of all, stop the Supreme Court from striking down any government laws or actions because they're unreasonable. The second is to give political appointees control of the, of the judicial selection panel. The third is allowed parliament um, to overrule all Supreme Court decisions by a simple majority. Now this one has been withdrawn uh, because it's, it's the one that was most exciting, the most uh, uh, opposition. 
but uh, they still they they still want to require there to be a supermajority of 12 of 15 Supreme Court justices to strike down any government law or action. And the fourth is to make the opinions of legal advisors in the agencies and ministries uh, um, advisory. Currently, they're binding, which means that the attorney general and the legal advisors basically can stop the government from doing something that's illegal. I'm going to focus the rest of my comments on the first two, abolishing reasonableness review and placing the appointment of judges, including Supreme Court judges, under the control of the political forces. Now, these probably seem to American lawyers as moderate. Like, yeah, why should the court have all this, um, uh, 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 all this power? And, there's, um, and, and that, that couples with the widespread view that the Israeli Supreme Court is one of the most activist courts in the history of the world, exercising, government, uh, exercising power over governmental decisions undreamed of uh, in other courts across the globe, or if you're a flat uh, earther across the face of the earth. Um, uh, some years ago, former Justice, Chief Justice Aharon Barak uh, published a book entitled The Judge in a Democracy. And Richard Posner, Judge Richard Posner, one of our leading legal academics and federal judges, wrote a very critical review of this book, which I got to read actually in TypeScript because Judge uh, Justice Barak was doing a, uh, some sort of sabbatical at... Uh, uh, at Harvard at the time. And Judge Posner no, has never, was never a shrinking violet in pushing his economic theory in his judicial actions. But he, even he was astounded at Barack's characterization of the proper role of a judiciary in a democracy. So I'm going to quote from his review. And the title is a dead giveaway. It's called Enlightened Despot. And, uh, <laughs> but here's the best. He says, only in Israel, as far as I know, do judges confer the power of abstract review on themselves without benefit of a constitutional or legislative provision. One is reminded of Napoleon's taking the crown out of the Pope's hand and putting it put out of the Pope's uh, uh, hands and putting it on his own head. But Posner says something in the, in the conclusion of the review that's telling. And I don't think he agrees with it as an excuse, but I, I, more, uh, um, uh, I think it's more uh, accurate than maybe the rest of his review. He says in explaining the role of the Israeli Supreme Court that Israel is an immature democracy, poorly governed. Its political class is mediocre and corrupt. It floats precariously in a, leaf, in a lethally hostile sea, and it really could use a constitution. Barack stepped into a political and legal vacuum, and with dash and ingenuity, orchestrated a series of, in Lawrence Tribe's words on the dust jacket, surprisingly agreeable outcomes. He was a legal buccaneer, and maybe that was what Israel needed. In my view, that's an accurate portrayal of how Israel's Supreme Court fits into the overall Israeli legal and political landscape. You have an immature, poorly governed, corrupt democracy in democracy in quotes. So um, now me and my family were once in Justice Barack's office and he showed us the map that the Israeli Supreme Court uses to decide where the Israeli military can, can maintain a wall of separation or a, really a fence of separation between Israel and the West Bank. And imagine an American court telling the military what they can do in an operation. Um, and but the uh, in more than one occasion, the Israeli Supreme Court said to the military, "That's unreasonable. It's harming the Palestinians, especially the farmers who can't reach their fields. It's harming them too much, and so therefore you have to put it somewhere else." And again, you know, the idea of the American court telling the military what to do in a military operation pretty striking. Now, so far, the only reform that's passed the Knesset, the Parliament, is the reasonableness review. And now it's before that same court, of course, to determine whether it's reasonable for the Parliament to get rid of reasonableness review. And, you know, try to say that three times fast. But, um, and, uh, um, and the whole court heard this case. They sat as 15-judge panel for the first time in their history. Um, now, what sort of cases provoke this? What are the reformers upset about? Well, first of all, the Israeli government wasn't allowed to transfer the family of terrorists, and that's in quote, transfer the families of terrorists from the West Bank to the Gaza Strip after terrorist attacks. In this case, the main case involved the brother of a terrorist who helped him evade capture. That's also in quotes. The government ordered the brother to Gaza Strip for two years as punishment for helping his other brother carry out a terrorist attack. And the Supreme Court said this was unreasonable. And now, it's not surprising that the government in Israel acts pretty forcefully sometimes, given its situation. But the court said that was too, um, uh, too, too extreme. The government, uh, the Supreme Court would not allow the, does not allow the government to deny entry to Israel of anyone associated with the, uh, with the boycott uh, of Israel, the BDS um, uh, movement. And it wouldn't allow the Minister of Justice to appoint a person to be state prosecuting attorney uh, because that uh, appointment was designed to obstruct the trial of Prime Minister Netanyahu, which is still going on. I don't know how they have trials the last three, four, five, six years, but the, the Prime Minister of Israel is still on trial for corruption right now. 
And uh, the Supreme Court said it would be unreasonable to put this person in as the prosecuting attorney because the whole idea was to stop the prosecution of a corrupt prime minister. Um, and uh, the opponents of the reform cite different cases. Like uh, in 1993, the Supreme Court forced Yitzhak Rabin to fire a cabinet minister who was charged with serious crimes of corruption. And uh, they're most concerned with the fact that the, if, they, if, uh, um, if they get rid of reasonableness review and change the selection method, that they will stop the prosecution of Prime Minister Netanyahu himself. And also that the government will be able to institute highly discriminatory measures against Israel's Arab citizens and the residents of the Palestinian territories in the West Bank. So again, in addition to the changes, of, uh, uh, the changes in the separation barrier, in 2000, the court ruled that it was unreasonable to deny an Arab family a plot of land in a Jewish community. And it's widely known in Israel that it's very difficult or impossible for Arabs to live in predominantly Jewish areas in Israel. And even in their own areas, the Israeli government denies the vast majority of building permits that are applied for and forces them to build illegally. And then the government tears down their homes and then they start again and build illegally again. And, and the, um, there's also a, a great deal of discrimination in public services, inferior schools, and just general public services in Israel to the Arab minority. And the Supreme Court of Israel has been the only organ of the government that's actually stood up to that at all, although and some people don't think it's done enough. The Supreme Court of Israel also said that the government's measures to protect school children who were uh, within the range of rockets from Gaza were unreasonable, and they ordered the government to take more steps for that. Um, now, in 1999, the court found certain methods of torture unreasonable and uh, that Israel's, the Israeli authorities were applying certain methods of torture, that that was un, uh, in order to uh, try to elicit uh, cooperation and confessions from uh, Palestinian detainees. Uh, but the Supreme Court of Israel did say it was okay to torture people if you were going to be able to use it to stop an imminent attack. So again, they didn't go as far as some people might want them to do. Um, in 2023, just recently, the court ruled that the defense minister couldn't stop Palestinians from entering Israel to attend a Remembrance Day commemoration so they could go to their, where they used to live before they left during the revolution. Uh, and in 2012, the court found that the blanket exemption from military service for ultra-Orthodox full-time yeshiva students was unreasonable. So the opponents fear that if the amendments pass, corruption will become even more of a norm in Israel, and the government will dismiss the attorney general and replace her with someone who will halt the prosecution of Prime Minister Netanyahu for corruption and will allow, uh, will allow um, much more harsh actions against uh, against the uh, Arab minority in Israel. Now, on judicial selection, basically today, the court itself and the Bar Association control the appointments to the courts. And the, the uh, government wants to, um, uh, wants to give control of appointments to the political system by letting the government choose the public members, which is now chosen by the Bar Association, and to uh, uh, reduce the number of members that the Supreme Court appoints. And the idea is to give the governing coalition uh, uh, control over the appointments to the court. Uh, and they, they say that the uh, court has become a self-perpetuating oligarchy. Now, you, um, uh, the, 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 I'm going to try to uh, get a, go a little faster with this because I think I'm going on for too long. So let's talk about the situation of the Israeli government and how the, how, what the Supreme Court of Israel reflects in terms of democracy. The Israeli governing coalition, the Prime Minister Netanyahu's uh, party got a little under a quarter of the vote. And the rest of the coalition is, uh, is composed of pretty extreme religious parties, two of which are overtly racist. And, uh, almost, uh, and all of them would like to have um, uh, religious rule be the law in Israel rather than the secular rule that there is today. One of them is actually an anti-Zionist paper. They don't even, that party, they don't want the state of Israel, but they do want the people there to be governed by uh, uh, religious law. And um, this seems, it's, it, so, so, so the idea is that those people should have control of, over the judicial appointments. Now, um, the, and, and uh, um, Israel's, the Israeli court's re reasonableness review may seem like a really unwarranted, undemocratic intervention into the operations of the government the two more democratic branches of government, but it's really just not true. It's a fallacy. The simple comparisons don't work. The way their governing coalition is formed in Israel facilitates governments that don't reflect the mainstream values of Israeli society, and they give outside, outsized powers to the extremists. The more, the more mainstream Likud party would lose its power if it didn't uh, um, 
uh, cater to the demands of the extremists. And the biggest problem if they lost their power to lead the coalition is that Netanyahu could no longer be the prime minister, which would put him more at risk of a criminal conviction. If you made a coalition of the Likud party and the other parties that represent more of the mainstream of Israel, you'd have a coalition that represented more than 50% of the voters, but again, Netanyahu couldn't be prime minister and that government would not stop the prosecution of Netanyahu. And the other thing is that there are no checks and balances in Israel between the legislative and the executive branches. That the, um, they're one and the same. And without a constitution, a court system under complete political control could be very anti-democratic, replicating the ability of an unrepresentative government to shape the law to its own preferences. The mainstream views of Israeli society would be more reflected in a different government, and it's certainly more reflected in the current Supreme Court. So when you add corruption to the extremist nature of the current Israeli coalition, you understand why the proposed judicial reforms excited such strong opposition from people who place democracy and the welfare of society, including the uh, Arab minority, above religious observance. The populace is not anti-democratic, it's anti-extremist and pro-democracy with a more sophisticated understanding of what democracy is. The current Israeli judiciary prevents the government from becoming what so many immature democratic governments become, winner-take-all government rife with corruption that's constantly in danger of sliding into a more authoritarian form of government as it shifts power uh, as it shifts in power, the place of members in places the members of government at personal risk of, autonomy, of accountability for their misdeeds. It can mean a radical shift in the direction of government policy as the extremists on each side of the spectrum lose their influence in favor of potential extreme forces on the other. Viewed in this context, the Israeli Supreme Court may be the only true voice of the people and the only voice of reason in the Israeli government system. When the coalition is beholden to extremists, there is no other government entity that can provide a check. Now, almost half of Israel's Jews think the state of Israel mistreats its Arab minorities. And adding, to, you add 80% of the Israeli Arabs who express that view, and we have a clear majority in democratic Israel who think so. Now, an obvious objection to my entire thesis is that the coalition was elected, and it must be undemocratic for a court to have the power to prevent the elected government from enacting its policies. Now, the mere fact of an election without attention to its underlying structure is just not a true indication of democracy. Nicolae Ceausescu, the le former leader of Romania, got 99.7% of the vote in 1960. By 1985, when we were on the precipice of the end of the communist dictatorships in Eastern Europe, his share had gotten down to 97.7, a massive slide. Um, and electoral outcomes, even in free elections, are not necessarily democratic, as we see in the apportionment of the United States Senate or, and the disastrous method of choosing the President of the United States. So, um, the, and now if you, t the, the last thing I'm going to talk about is the method of selection. And the idea of the Israeli method of selection is they say, well look, in the United States, the judges are selected by the political branches. Wouldn't that be better if we could also have more political control over that? And in my view, the average Israeli, Israeli is rightly afraid of turning over control of appointments to the Supreme Court to its politicians, where again the extremists would have outside influence. They can see in the United States how politically appointed justices behave, reshaping the law according to their ideological commitments and political allegiances. It's not always that way, but when it is, it's striking. So again, the example of the 1870s and 1880s when the court struck down civil rights laws. The court played, uh, its, and played this key role in dooming millions of Americans to second-class citizenship for nearly a century. And that wasn't re legally remedied until statutes passed in the 1960s were upheld and more gen generously applied. <laughs> and even then, there have been dozens of inst instances in which the court's actions were reversed by a more liberal Congress. That's a, a military training going on. If you go, yeah, if you go to Israel, if you go to Israel for a, you can do military training for a day and carry rocks the weight of, of, of wounded soldiers up and down big hills um, to learn to see what they go through. But in any case, um, so you look at what's happened in our court over the last 15 or 20 years. Standing in the way of environmental regulation that scientists think are, is necessary to ward off major threats to the future of our society. And hindering the government's response to the pandemic with crabbed readings 
of regulatory statutes and illogical rulings, such as holding unlawful New York's restrictions on religious gatherings that were less restrictive than rules placed on similar secular places like theaters and classrooms, but more restrictive than rules governing grocery stores and pharmacies. Now, it doesn't take a legal mind like Carl Llewellyn's to see that human interaction in a church sanctuary is more like those in a classroom than in a grocery store. But that's what we have now because we have political control and political manipulation of the membership of our Supreme Court. In short, we should trust the support of, uh, for the twin ideals of justice and democracy from the hundreds of thousands of Israelis who oppose the reforms more than the assurances of the corrupt and narrowly focused coalition and that the reasons for this reform are about democracy, not against it. We should, uh, we should not look beyond our own politically chosen and manipulated court membership to see the danger when courts become arms of the political branches during a time of serious problems, political division, and striking corruption. If the Israeli form has ultimately prevail, it will, in my view, be another step in the worldwide slide away from democracy and justice. And finally, I just want to say thank you all so much for listening. Thank you for being here. And thanks again to Boston University and my faculty colleagues and all my students and alumni for all the support and all the warmth and friendship you've given me over the decades. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Thank you for your uh, national and global voice. Thank you for your dedication to our community. Thank you for your humor, which you bring all the time to our wonderful community. Um, both of you, Professors Outerson and Bierman, make us so proud to be connected with Boston University School of Law. I want to thank everyone who attended this event for attending the event. I want to thank all of our alumni for their generosity to BU Law, to our students, to our faculty, our staff each and every day. In fact, the event we had today is a really wonderful illustration of the impact that our alumni have through their giving, through their time, their talent, and treasure to BU Law. The generosity of alumni like Philip Beck underscores the tremendous value that our alumni can and do contribute to our community. Financial gifts of all kinds, small and large, are incredibly important because they enable us to serve our students, our faculty, our staff, and our mission in ways that otherwise would not be possible. But our alumni also contribute in other ways, like serving as mentors, hiring our graduates, we encourage you to do that, <laughs> and much more. I'm grateful for the wide-ranging, meaningful support that so many of our alumni give. So thank you, thank you, thank you. To conclude our ceremony, I would like to give a toast, although we don't have anything to toast yet. Um, um, please raise your, raise your hands in, in honor of our very own Jack Bierman and Kevin Outerson, who embody the very best of scholarship, teaching, and service. Congratulations to you both on this very well-deserved honor. You have more than earned it. Thank you all for coming. I hope you'll join us for lunch. And I'm not sure, are we inside, outside? Right here. We're out in the atrium. All right. Please join us for lunch.